Okay, welcome. Uh, so this will be our first lecture on the new online format. And my goal here is to help guide you through the reading. It's a fairly long reading, but because we're not meeting in class, um, we're just going to have to do more work on our own. And my goal is to take you through the preface that I assigned uh, and kind of page by page sort of tell you what Merleau-Ponty is getting at. His writing is, in my opinion, very nice to read. I know that's not a universally held opinion. Um, and what he says in the, my experience of reading it is that as he's saying it, it sort of makes this flash of insight and then it's sort of hard to hold on to that afterward. So again, my goal is to just point you at the main ideas that he's getting across here. Before we go into depth on that, uh, a little bit about Merleau-Ponty. He's a French philosopher, uh, a prominent French, French intellectual while he lived, uh, mostly active during the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, he worked closely with Jean-Paul Sartre. He was an army officer in World War II. And, you know, in this time uh, between the 30s and 40s, Husserl had was died in 1938 and in this sort of early 20th century philosophical climate phenomenology was spreading throughout Europe and particularly took a, a stronghold in France so that's where Merleau-Ponty comes in uh, he was very strongly influenced by Husserl and takes phenomenology in his own direction but always from a Husserlian starting point. So it's very important to understand where he's coming from, which is what we've been doing for the past uh, parts of the semester until now. So Merleau-Ponty was very impressed by Husserl's phenomenology, but he thought that his approach remained a bit too old fashioned and stuck in old kind of epistemological modes of thoughts. So Merleau-Ponty takes phenomenology in an existentialist direction, which means he wanted to focus more on concrete lived experiences than Husserl had done. He thought Husserl remained too intellectual. To understand experience is not just to understand how the material world is constituted, which was sort of Husserl's obsession, but also to understand how the world um, as a place of human action and human concern and emotion is constituted. Uh, not the world is not only the place of material objects studied by the material sciences, but also the place of emotions, ambitions, freedoms, goals, and so on and so forth. Merleau-Ponty also thought that Husserl's theory of intentionality remained stuck in the subject-object dichotomy. He thought that there was uh, too much of that remained in Husserl. So we can see here uh, remember, this is Husserl's structure of intentionality. So the arrow pointing us towards the object, say we're focusing right now on the lecture. Well, the lecture video is the object, and you as the subject watching the video are performing a noesis. That is, you are listening and constituting my words for yourself and your experience, and that is helping direct you onto the thing that you're thinking about or uh, or watching and of course the thing that you're thinking about or watching the lecture video itself is embedded in a horizon there's the background um, say you're watching this on a computer screen the wall is in the horizon and so on and so forth all that stuff that's in the background and you're being bringing your background knowledge to bear on what I'm saying everything we've gone over in the first eight weeks of the semester is also informing what you're, how you are taking in the object. So all of that is meant to be captured by Husserl's structure of intentionality, which we've gone over. But you can see that there's a subject-object dichotomy in this. The I is the subject doing the noesis, and the object is the thing that you are kind of taking in. Uh, so there's a, a strict polarity here between subject or what Husserl would sometimes call the ego pole and the object pole of intentionality. And 
Husserl locates the lived body, the embodiment that we talked about a few weeks ago, in the subject part. Right? So Merleau-Ponty has a very distinctive take on the body. He thinks the body embodiment is far more important than a lot of people had given credit for throughout the history of philosophy. And then Husserl talked a lot about embodiment, but not enough from Merleau-Ponty's perspective. So instead of the body being a kind of part of, you know, the eye here, part, it, it sort of retain, um, insulated into one part of the structure here, the body for, for Merleau-Ponty sort of casts its sway over the whole structure. So this whole thing is kind of the lived body for Merleau-Ponty. That's just by way of preview. We'll get into that much more as we go. So thinking now more specifically about the preface that we read, these are the major topics that, that Merleau-Ponty discusses in the preface. He wants to give his own take on each of these Husserlian ideas. So he takes each of these from Husserl and gives his own spin on them, retaining a lot of the Husserlian aspects, but then taking them in this new existentialist direction. So he wants to talk about phenomenological method, and he thinks there's something paradoxical about that, but he doesn't think that that's a problem. So the paradoxes or tensions in phenomenological method are part of what that method discloses or shows us not problems for the method. We should, instead of thinking, oh, phenomenological method is paradoxical or it's hard to do, um, instead of thinking, well, that means we should just throw it out, he rather says that that's part of what it's revealing to us is the paradoxical nature of reality. Um, what is phenomenology study? What is the subject matter of phenomenology? That's something else he'll, he'll talk about. So he's gonna talk about the life world and how phenomenology discusses how science is possible and the unity of science or what makes all the sciences part of one project, even though say we have very different kinds of sciences. Sociology, very different from chemistry, very different from biology. So how do the, all of those sciences come together into a unity of some sort? Well, phenomenology has something to say about that. And in particular, it has to do with perception. The way we perceive the world is very, very important for Milo Ponty. You might have guessed that from the name of this book, which is The Phenomenology of Perception. And he thinks in some way, this is oversimplifying it, but in some way, perception is the whole shebang. What we need to do is get clear on what's happening when we perceive the world. It may seem simple enough. Light rays are coming into our eyes and the optical me mechanisms in our brain form an image. But something else is going on here for Merleau Ponty that's very, very decisive for philosophy as a whole. He is, he's then going to give his take on intentionality, which of course is a central Husserlian theme, and Merleau Ponty will have his own things to say about that. And then he'll leave us off by giving us his conception of phenomenology as an infinite task that is something never to be finished once and for all. Okay, so I'm going to take us through sort of page by page, and from on, on the first few pages of the reading, we find this quote. Um, Although it is a transcendental philosophy that suspends the affirmations of the natural attitude in order to understand them, it is also a philosophy for which the world is always already there prior to reflection, like an inalienable presence and whose entire effort is to rediscover this naive contact with the world in order to finally raise it to a philosophical status. It is the goal of a philosophy, and on and on he goes. So what is he saying in this passage? Well, he's talking about phenomenological method. Here he's, re he's referencing Husserl's method of reduction. That's what he means when he says um, phenomenology is a kind of philosophy that suspends the affirmations of the natural attitude. Well, think back to some of the very first weeks of the semester when we talked about the natural attitude. So what is the natural attitude? Um, again, that's when we just go around like we do in our everyday life and we assume the world exists. Say you need to go to the library, check out a book for one of your classes. 
Well, you're not walking into the library wondering whether the library exists. Uh, unless you're a philosophy major, then maybe you are. But in general, people aren't walking around doing that. They're just saying, here's the library. It exists. The books in here are real things. They're physical things. They're not worried about that. Um, and that seems to be something that happens passively for us. We don't need to walk around and theorize and, and convince ourselves through argument that the world is real. So it seems like something that's just automatic. But what Husserl wants to say with his phenomenological reduction is that it's not actually, it's something we can choose not to do. We can actually suspend our belief in the external world. We can suspend this process of positing it as real. Now, we need to qualify that because we can't actually suspend the process of qualifying as real, but we can take ourselves away from that, kind of step back and not participate in it and try to just see what's happening when we, when we posit the real world in our everyday life. Even when we do this, as Husserl says, the world remains there for us. Um, so this starts to give us uh, part of Merleau-Ponty's method, which is he wants to give us two sides, incompatible sides of a coin, and kind of show us how we need to see both of these incompatible sides of the coin as being actually unified in some way. So we're supposed to suspend the, the natural world, but the world always remains there. So um, there's this sort of inconsistency, but if we're seeing things correctly, it's not an inconsistency. That's sort of the interesting thing that phenomenology is supposed to reveal, that if we stop our participation in this positing behavior, positing the real world as actual, the real world stays there. So it's not like we are gods that have the power to just destroy the world when we stop participating in this behavior. So that says something important about the world. It's always already there. We can start reflecting phenomenal phenomenologically, but the world doesn't sort of pop into presence or out of presence when we do that. It's always already there. It's always going to be the basis of our reflection. So what does phenomenology want to do? It wants to suspend our naive contact when we're running around in our daily business. We're just naively assuming the world is there. We want to come to understand that. So that's what he means when he says, our entire effort as phenomenologists is to rediscover this naive contact with the world in order to finally raise that naive contact to a philosoph philosophical status. The, the world as we naturally think of it, as we naturally live in it, more importantly, that's what we want to bring into philosophical comprehension.